morning, everyone. How are we? Everybody nice and warm in here. The snow's outside. It's been a, quite a cool weekend. Uh, this weekend, this Friday, I shot my first buck. I was really, really proud of that. It was a good thing. You know? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I feel like I'm a real Kansan now because I've been hunting out here and I've gotten a wild animal, you know, and it's, it's just, it's just, I think I, feel, I grew a few chest hairs when I, when I got that deer. It was a good thing. It was a really good thing. So, uh, hey, if you're new with this, in all seriousness, my name's uh, Pastor Brian and I'm, I'm uh, one of the pastors here. I'm really glad that you're here with us. Uh, many of our folks are joining us online. I want to say welcome to all those who are online uh, joining us. And as uh, Josh mentioned earlier, uh, we are doing this Christmas give back where we're trying to give back as much as we possibly can to ABC Pregnancy Center here uh, during the holiday season. Uh, so make sure if you are online watching, make sure you comment with your name and then however many people that are in your party. Uh, you guys did a great job of that last week, so we were able to count you. Uh, for all of you guys in attendance, you have to do nothing but sit there. You did your job. You're here, all right? So you get to contribute towards that, uh, that uh, donation that we're going to be giving to ABC Pregnancy. It's a great way to bring life uh, to our community. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, actually two things before we jump into the service uh, or to the sermon this morning. Um, a lot of you guys do year-end giving, and so I was talking with our uh, finance director over in the office this week, and Normally, by this point, we've talked about this, and it's just kind of escaped us. But if you want to do any year-end giving and count it for the year 2020, make sure that whatever you're giving has been postmarked by December 31st, and then it will count for 2020. You can either drop that by the office. Um, if the office is closed, and typically the week of Christmas, uh, the office will be closed, but there's a drop box, a, a secure drop box outside the office doors. You can drop that check in there or uh, however you're planning to give. But just make sure that it's postmarked and dated uh, by December the 31st if you want to do that year in giving. I know many of you guys uh, do that as we wrap up the year in December. Um, the last thing I want to share with you was um, something that's really been heavy on my heart for the past six to eight months. And uh, it's interesting how that as God's impressed my heart about something, our elders were already thinking in the same vein. And it was beautiful how this all worked together. But um, one of the burdens that I've had and, and your elders um, have had here at the church is that we want to really make sure that each person that calls BCC home is, is truly cared for and shepherded well. Okay? There's always going to be times where things fall through the cracks because we're human beings. But but to the best of our ability, we want to make sure every single person is cared for and shepherded well. And as you look at 1 Timothy 3 and the qualifications of the elders and the expectations of those elders, one of the key qualifications of that elder is that they are a shepherd okay, to the people. So one of the things that's been heavy on our hearts is that we don't want it just to be a thing where the elders gather in a room and make decisions for the church, but that they're actually out loving on the church and shepherding the church. And so what we did over the past several months, and it's all in place as of right now as I speak, um, we went through and we sifted through every person that's a partner member at BCC that's in our database, and we divided each of those family units up. So whether that's you as a single person or you as a family of five or six, whatever that is, we took every family unit and we divided them evenly amongst all the elders. And so what you're going to have now is is a shepherd elder as we move forward into the new year. Now, what that does mean is that if you are not a partner member and you're not in our database, you are not with a shepherd elder as of right now. If you would like to be, all right, this is a little plug for our partnership class that's coming back in February. Go through the partnership class, get in the database, and we'd be happy to assign an elder to you that can care for you. But what it's going to look like is two to three times a year, those elders are going to be calling you to check in on you. Now, it's not like a checkup in the bad way, all right? They're not going to be like, hey, we noticed you weren't at church on Sunday, all right? We're not doing that. That's not what this is about. They're genuinely going to call and find out what's going on in your life. What are some things that that, that that elder specifically can pray for you about? What are some ways in which they can encourage you? Are there any areas in which you need help? And so it's going to give you a direct line in with them, and it's going to allow them to function the way God designed elders to function as those shepherds. So if you get a phone call in the next few weeks or the next few days from a number you don't recognize, it potentially may not be spam. Though I get a ton of spam calls since I've moved here. I don't know what happened, but I get them like every day. It may not be a spam call. It may be one of your uh, elders, your shepherd elders who's going to be calling to check in on you. So be on the lookout for that. We want to make sure that uh, we never are lids as leaders, okay? As your pastor, there's a lid at which uh, the amount of people that I can appropriately care for. But amongst our elder team of eight men, there's a lot more people that can be cared for all at once in a healthy way that's sustainable um, and encourages all parties involved, okay? Does that sound good? Everybody say yes. Very good. So that's coming to you. I want to put that in front of you before we jump into the message today. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we're going to continue in our series, uh, Home for Christmas. Everyone say, Home for Christmas. 
Hopefully you've been enjoying the series so far. Last week we talked about sin, and it was a little bit hairy. It was a little bit sticky. It was a little bit, ew, it didn't make me feel real great. Hopefully this week will make you feel really good because we're going to talk about Jesus this morning, all right? Let's pray and we'll jump in. Father, thank you for the chance to open your word. Um, Lord, as we look to your word, uh, would you help it, as you've promised, not to return void in our lives? Uh, would it produce uh, fruit in our, in our hearts and in our lives and in our actions? Uh, good fruit that goes out and sows more seeds of the gospel in the people's lives that you've planted us in the midst of? And that changes our lives, changes our marriages, changes our families today. And God, I pray you'd help us to be uh, grateful for this Christmas season, that we wouldn't take it for granted, that we wouldn't grow numb to it, but that we'd be excited about what happened and what Christmas represents, the length uh, to which you went to bring us home. And so today, as we open up your word, God, as we ask always, help us to leave changed and not the same. In Jesus' name, amen. (sighs) Guys, if we have learned anything this year in 2020, Um, it is that we are not in control, right? You know, as you look at COVID and all the different things that have gone around in this world and are still present in the world around us in 2020, it very quickly shows us as human beings how vulnerable we are, how fragile we are, how at times how hopeless things can feel as human beings. And I think, I think God allows these things to come into our lives uh, for that very reason, to point us back to him. Because there are months and weeks, and maybe even sometimes for you guys, years at a time where you feel like, you know what, I've got life by the tail. I've got things in control. I, I'm, life is going smoothly. This is great. But there are moments like 2020, since the month of March in 2020, that quickly show us how out of control we really are and how vulnerable we are as we're confronted with the fragileness of the human condition. We have the inability to fix things. As much as people have tried to fix things, as much as people have tried to control things and remedy things, there hasn't been any remedy so far, all right? It's quickly shown us how fragile we are as human beings. And I'll tell you this too. When it comes to coming home for Christmas, coming back into a relationship with God, we are just as hopeless as maybe many of us have felt in 2020. Did you realize that? When it comes to us making ourselves right before God, coming back into a right relationship with him, we are just as fragile and just as hopeless and just as helpless as 2020 has made us feel this year. Because of our sinfulness that we talked about last week, which, by the way, if you missed that message, please go back and listen to it, okay? Go back and watch it. It's on the YouTube channel. It's also floating around on Facebook. Go watch that, okay? We talked about how our sin placed us last week. We were under the wrath of God before Jesus came. We were suppressing the truths in our lives, right? Where the truth of God's word was suppressed, and we were living in sin. And ultimately, what we said was, God, we don't need you. We're going to set ourselves up as little gods with a little g, a lowercase g on the front of that word. And because Because of that sin, we are helpless and we are hopeless and we have no ability to fix or remedy ourselves. We have no ability like Americans like to do many times. And we can't can't just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps when it comes to coming back into a right relationship with God. No, we need a Savior. We need Jesus, not as an option, not as a supplement, but as a whole. We need Jesus to bring us home again. And I'll tell you this, this in part is why the gospel is so offensive. Now, I touched on this last week very briefly, but let me dig into it a little bit here. The reason why the gospel is so offensive, the reason uh, of Jesus coming, why it's so offensive is what it does. It confirms that there is nothing good about you and me before Jesus saves us. Nothing at all good about you or me. And you say, well, I'm, I'm not a Christian yet, and I do good things sometimes. But here's the thing. Your motives behind why you do those good things taint those good things that you do. You realize that? So you, many times the good things we do are to make us feel good or to give us fulfillment before we come to know Jesus Christ, right? It, it's all about us. It's about our reputation. It's about how people view us. It's because we do good things because we feel guilty and we should do them, okay? All of those things taint any right things that we do before Jesus Christ. There is nothing good about us, and that is why we need Jesus Christ to come at Christmas. Now, this, fl- this idea flies in the face of what culture preaches about human beings. Now, last week, as I said, we dogged culture pretty hard, okay? We got really candid about what culture believes. This is another flaw in our culture, and it's been around for, for many, many, many years, all right? This has been around since probably the beginning of time, all right? But I can only speak for what I've experienced in my almost 40 years on this planet, all right? But this is what culture preaches about human beings. Culture believes that we're all basically good people who occasionally do wrong things. 
we're all basically good at our core. It's just, you know, that person didn't have the opportunities or that person didn't have the right information. You know, there weren't the right rules on the outside of that person to contain that person and help them be the great person that they were meant to be. And so what culture says is with the right rules and the right standards on the outside, with the right amount of information, right, the right amount of intellect that we can become that wonderful person that we are supposed to be. We can become our, our best selves. You hear that all the time, don't you? You need to be your best self. You need to be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. You know what I mean, right? It's on the level of treat yourself, if you know the reference, all right? But they, 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 you hear this all throughout culture. And because culture believes that you're basically good and you occasionally do wrong, this is, these are some of the, the uh, flaws at which they think. This is why our culture thinks that prison actually reforms people. We can look down through history and see that, right? Like prison does nothing but just produce more people that create more criminal acts. The people that get in there that are supposed to be reformed by those external rules because they're thought to be basically good people who just had a bad break and made one bad decision, they get out and historically and statistically, they commit another crime and another crime and another crime. They're serial crime committers is what happens. But they think, our culture thinks the prison system is what's going to fix people. They also think that uh, our culture thinks that social programs and entitlements will eventually cure poverty. Again, look at history. Look at statistics. I'm not saying we shouldn't give people a little leg up occasionally when they do hit a rough patch. But overall, what it's done is just create more poverty and more dependence is what it's done. Because it's, you're not dealing with people who are basically good who occasionally do wrong or just occasionally get a bad break. You're dealing with people that are inherently wicked and sinful and hopeless, which is what Paul's going to tell us here in just a moment. Let me give you a couple more, all right? Uh, our culture thinks, uh, based on this premise, that taking guns away from Americans will somehow fix criminals and keep them from harming other people, okay? Well, it's just from a purely rational standard, okay? And I know last week we, t- well, we said that when you reject the truth long enough, you stop living in reality. So I-, I-, I will acquiesce and admit that right now, but like, think about this. They're criminals, okay? They do bad things. So they're not going to obey a law that says they can't have a firearm. But again, our our culture and many politicians would say, well, if you take the firearms away, that'll keep bad people from doing bad things because they're basically good people, right? And they just occasionally do wrong. So we need to somehow with these external rules curb that and fix them and make them into a wonderful person. It does not work. Uh, Go to the school system for a moment, okay? Uh, Our culture thinks that, again, basically because we're basically good people that occasionally do wrong, you know, if we teach kids about sex at a young age, that'll help them make better decisions about who they hop in bed with. How has that worked out for our country? Abortions have gone through the roof because of unplanned pregnancies. STDs have gone through the roof because of promiscuity. It's not a lack of information. What we're showing by the results of these various programs failing is that we as human beings are incredibly inherently sinful and wicked without hope. We are completely bad, not basically good and occasionally do bad. We are completely bad. It's the same reason that the whole D.A.R.E. program years ago and any drug programs that are out there today haven't worked when it comes to education, right? Well, you know, if we just educate the kids on how bad drugs are, they're basically good kids and they'll make good decisions based on that. They won't stick needles in their arm. Again, how has that worked out for us? It hasn't worked at all because we as human beings are not good people that occasionally do wrong Paul says, look, you are absolutely wicked, sinful people. That's how we're born. We inherited it from our human father, Adam, because of the sin that he committed in the garden. Last week, we made this statement. We said, our problem is not a mental problem. It's a moral problem. It's not that we don't know right and wrong. It's not that we don't have the information. It's that we don't like right and wrong. And it's that we even can't even do right at all apart from Jesus Christ. Our motives, as I said a moment ago, our motives taint those good deeds we do before coming in contact with Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible says, and Paul tells us in Romans, where we looked last week, that we are completely and utterly sinful, and that means we are completely and utterly without hope. Romans 3.10 is a very uh, very famous uh, passage out of the book of Romans, and it says this. It says, there is none righteous, no, not even one. Everyone say, none righteous. There is none righteous, no, not even 
one. You take the greatest, most uh, wonderfully heroic, most compassionate person in this life that doesn't know Jesus, and, and, and Paul would say, look, they are not righteous because they have, they, they have inherited the sinful nature from their earthly father, Adam. There's none righteous, no, not one. We're not basically good and occasionally do wrong things, but we are inherently sinful and wicked people who have no righteousness in us apart from Jesus. And because of that, we're completely and hopelessly lost. Now, again, we dug into that a little bit more in detail last week. But again, I told you, before we can really truly appreciate Christmas, we've got to understand our condition in sin And yet, not only in sin, but completely and hopelessly lost, as Paul describes us here. We are far from home. We need rescue. We need a Savior so that we can come home because we will never get home on our own. But here's the thought I've had as I've been studying through this. Who would dare try to save a people who were shaking their fists back at them in rebellion and sin? Remember I told you our condition last week was that we were rebellious towards God. We say, God, we understand the truth. But we know better and we don't need you. We'll set ourselves up as our own little gods. I don't need you, God. I understand you're my creator, but I'm going to choose to worship the creature rather than the creator. I'm going to set myself up as God. And I thought to myself, what kind of being and what kind of king would leave his throne to come save his enemies? those who were shaking their fists in rebellion, those who had actively rejected his rule in their life. And Paul here in Philippians today, if you want to turn there, go ahead. Philippians 2. Paul tells us the only one who could and the only one who did was Jesus Christ, who we celebrate here at Christmas. Look at Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Read these with me. You ready? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Okay? Then he's going to, he's going to describe the mindset that Jesus had. He's going to tell us uh, Jesus' thought process and then the process of what it took to come to bring us home. He says, Jesus Christ, uh, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So if you're taking notes, number one is this, that Jesus here is eternally God. Now, I'll tell you this, as we dig into this passage today, the points today are going to sound extremely simple and extremely bottom shelf, right? But they're going to represent such high truth. And, I'm ta- and we're, we're actually going to talk about two out of the three most difficult things to uh, grasp as human beings when it comes to Scripture. The three most difficult things in Scripture in my mind and in a lot of theologians' minds are the Trinity, the virgin birth, and Jesus coming as a man, the incarnation. We're going to tackle two of those today briefly as we walk through this passage together. So I want you to buckle up and I want you to put your thinking caps on as we talk about a few different ideas around this. And don't let the simplicity of the points fool you at all because this is some deep, heady stuff. And it ought to, what it ought to do, let me say this too before we go in. It ought to well up and overflow worship out of you towards Jesus. Sometimes when you look at things in Scripture and you say, man, I just don't fully understand this. I just don't fully grasp it. Listen, you can believe something without 100% fully uh, understanding something. Now, I'm not saying check your brain at the door by any stretch of the imagination, but there are some truths that we're going to talk about today that we won't understand in full until we get to heaven one day again, all right? Until we go home once and for all in glory, we will not fully understand these. But that ought not discourage worship. That actually ought to inspire worship in our hearts. The fact that we serve a God and we worship Jesus who is above us, He is outside of our mental, finite human capabilities. It ought to inspire worship in us and not discourage us from worshiping. If that makes sense, say yes. He says Jesus was eternally God. Paul begins with Jesus in his preexistent state in heaven in the form of God. This is the way Jesus had always existed from eternity's past. Jesus was in the glory and splendor of heaven in the presence of God, equal with God and in need of nothing. Which, by the way, those who would say Jesus coming to bring us home was because he needed us and couldn't live without us, contrary to some of your favorite worship songs, that is not true, all right? Jesus needed nothing. He needed no one. He lived in the full sufficiency of the Trinity within the Godhead. Full sufficiency, needing absolutely nothing. Nothing. And we're going to talk about why he came, but it wasn't because he needed us. So get that straight in your mind before we keep going. 
He was in a perfect relationship in the presence of God the Father. And Paul said he was in the form of God and that he was equal with God. There's some Trinity talk for you there, okay? We won't dig too deeply into this, but that's some Trinity conversation there that Paul's introducing. One God eternally existent in three persons. He was equal with God within the Trinity in heaven. uh, He was self-sufficient and in need of nothing. But here's what's fascinating about this part of the passage. Even though Jesus is in the perfect comfort and sufficiency and harmony of heaven, existing within the Trinity in need of nothing, Paul says he did not consider that position as something to be held on to for his own sake. He said he didn't consider it as something to be grasped. Some translations you look at will say he didn't consider it something to be used uh, for his own advantage, all right? And, And so Paul says, even though he was equal with God in this perfection of heaven, he didn't count that as something to be held onto for his own sake. You could say it this way. Jesus did not consider his comfort above our need. Jesus did not consider his comfort above our need. This is actually, in fact, the the point of the passage here that Paul's writing in this letter to the church at Philippi, okay? We won't dig into this too far. You can read it later. His purpose in this passage here to the, the Philippians, he's telling believers to be like Jesus and put the needs of others before yourselves. He says, you should serve other people in humility with humble, meek hearts, looking at the needs of others and not yourself. And then he goes into this passage about Jesus. He says, have the mind like Jesus Christ. And within this mind that he describes of Christ, we're given a beautiful glimpse of what Jesus did for us at Christmas. He says, serve them with humility. And what a clear picture we have of Jesus in what he's describing here. Jesus owed us nothing but the wrath we deserve because of our sin. But instead of leaving us for dead, instead of sitting back and saying, you know what? I didn't, I didn't participate in that problem. I'm not going to participate in the solution. Jesus didn't sit back and say, they didn't sit back and pontificate about ways to save us and never step in. No, we see that even though he was eternally God, he eventually is going to become one of us. He moves towards our brokenness, willing to put aside what's best for him for what's best for us. Uh, You you might picture the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Don't turn there, but I'll just explain it to you. The story of the Good Samaritan in chapter 10 was a parable that Jesus told, and it actually pictures very beautifully what Jesus did for us at Christmas. See, the Samaritan traveling down the road, he comes across this beaten Jewish guy who's been beaten and left for dead and robbed on the side of the road. He owed that man nothing, okay? He owed that man nothing. In fact, those Samaritans, as many of you probably know, the Samaritans and the Jews were enemies of one another. They wished one another were dead. They wished they could wipe the other party off the face of the planet. That was the way they functioned together. And so even though they were enemies, boy, look at the parallel here between that and Jesus. Even though they were enemies, that Samaritan man didn't just keep walking down the road and say, you know what? No, I got to get to, I got to get to Sam's club. I got to buy my food for the week. I got to get to the store. I'm not stopping. You know, I got a good day going here. It's been a good morning so far. Got up. The birds were singing. It's been a great day. I've got money in my satchel and I'm going to Sam's club or wherever it was they shopped back in the day. All right. In, instead of continuing on what was comfortable and easy for him, what's he do? He interrupts himself. He interrupts the good situation that he was experiencing to move toward the brokenness of this Jewish man who's been beaten and left for dead. And he did whatever it took, even becoming uncomfortable and giving of his own resources in order to rescue the injured man, even when he didn't have to. This is what Paul says Jesus did for us. Jesus owed us nothing. Jesus could have, remember last week we talked about the the passive wrath of God? Jesus could have left us to the passive wrath of God and just let us destroy ourselves. And instead, him being eternally God, he says, no, 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 I'm I'm going to intervene in this situation. I love these people too much to let them destroy themselves. Jesus showed the, the heart of God when he came because he was eternally God. But look at what Paul says about him next. If you're taking notes, number two is this. Not only was Jesus eternally God, but Jesus became one of us. Look at verse six again. Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, okay? Not to be used to his own advantage. But he emptied himself. Everyone say emptied. Emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. See, what he's describing here, this is, this is Bethlehem. 
Okay? This is the, the incarnation of Christ. That word's not a real familiar word or one that you use very commonly, is it? I doubt any of you have used the word incarnation in the last like year or your entire life. You probably have never even stated the word, but maybe you've heard it before. The idea is simply this. It is, it is God putting on flesh. What it means is putting on flesh. Um, if you think about uh, in the food sector, you know how you can tell by looking at me, I think about food a time or two throughout the week. You think about this. Uh, you ever heard of uh, chili con carne? You ever heard of that before? You know what that means? Chili con carne, chili with meat in it, with flesh in it. I know flesh is a really gross word to say when you're talking about food you're going to eat. But it's, it, what it means is it's chili with meat in it. That's the idea here. Incarnation, okay? Carne, all right? It's the same idea, all right? It was God putting on flesh and becoming one of us. This is what he did when he came to that manger in Bethlehem. And Jesus did this, Paul says, by emptying himself. Now listen very closely to this. This is really important. It gets very confused sometimes. Emptying himself or emptied himself, as Paul phrases it, means that Jesus laid down his glory in heaven in order to be brought low. He laid down his glory in heaven. Now, in part, we know this because uh, at, at the end of Jesus' life, right before he gets crucified, he's in the garden praying and talking to God the Father, and he actually asked God the Father to restore him to the glory that he had before he became a man, okay? He actually requests to be restored to that glory. So we know that he laid that glory aside. Stay with me, okay? He laid down the rights and privileges of the king he rightfully was to become a man for you and me. Again, he owed us nothing. He had every right to continue to operate as a conquering king in heaven, and yet he laid those things aside. Listen to this part. This means emptying himself means that he laid down his rights to voluntarily use his divine power in order to submit to the will of the Father here on the earth, that he laid down his divine power, okay? Now, this is really, really important. Don't miss this, okay? Even though, all right, he laid down his rights to voluntarily use his divine power. Jesus never lost his divine power or his deity. He never lost his divine power or his deity in becoming a man. And because this is such an enormous contrast that Paul's bringing out here, this form from going from form of God to form of a man in the form of a servant, there are a lot of people that have incorrectly taken this to mean that Jesus ceased to be God or ceased to be divine when he became a man. But that's not what Jesus did. Let me explain what I mean by this, okay? Paul describes it this way. He says he, he, says he was in the form, everyone say form. He was in the form of God, but he emptied himself by taking on the form, everybody say form, form of a servant. There's a parallel here, but there's an incredible contrast in this. Think about this for a minute. The word form that he uses here, uh, it does not mean shape, okay? Many times when we think of form, we think of the shape of something. This is not what he's talking about here, okay? Um, the word form that he uses there is a Greek word that actually doesn't have a clear English equivalent. Um, in fact, it's a philosophical term that means this. Listen closely. It means an outward expression of an inner essence. An outward expression of an inner essence essence. Think about it this way. Uh, if you guys ever watched the Olympics, all right? People like the Olympics in here. I enjoy watching it from time to time. Um, sometimes maybe you've watched the figure skaters uh, on the Olympics, right? Little known fact about your pastor, I actually took ice skating as my PE class in college to meet girls. It didn't work so, like I met girls, but I didn't like get to take one home with me and marry one. I ended up meeting Sonia after college, but that's neither here nor there, and it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But that's a little known fact. You can, you can talk about that over lunch. Pastor Brian took ice skating? You know, how to ice skate? I could never do the triple sow cow or whatever in the world those things were called, but I can stay on my feet and not fall. Anyway, that's neither here nor there, okay? You watch the Olympics and you watch the figure skaters go around, and it's beautiful what they can do. I mean, it's incredible. Like, and if you've ever ice skated, you understand how difficult it is to ice skate and to do some of these jumps and things that they do out there on the ice. But when you watch someone figure skate in the Olympics, what you might say is, wow, that skater's form was incredible. That skater's form was amazing. That was incredible. And what we mean is their rhythm, their grace, their coordinated movements were the outward expression of an inward ability. You with me? That's their form, okay? In other words, uh, they could still have, or they could have the ability and just choose to not express it outwardly if they were sitting on the sidelines, not using the ability in front of everyone. Does that make sense? They could choose to lay that aside. It never leaves them. They still have the ability, and they still have that within them, that inner essence, that inner ability. They're just choosing not to express it on the ice, on the outside, outwardly. So what we have in Jesus coming at Christmas, don't miss this, 
when he comes to be born as a baby in Bethlehem in a manger, what's happening is that his outward expression changes to that of a man while he still retains all of his deity. His outward expression becomes that of a man, but he still retains all of his godness, all of his divinity, all of his deity. But when he became a man, it wasn't just a costume that he wore. It wasn't just that he like went to the nearest Halloween Express up in heaven and picked up a costume that looked like a, a baby and said, I'm going to strap that on over me and still be God on the inside and just be this facade or this charade or this costume on the outside. No, no, no. He took on a full human nature and body in addition to his divine nature. He took on the full limits of humanity. Uh, one early theologian, I don't, I don't think I have it on the screen, but one early theologian put it this way. He said, Jesus uh, remaining what he was, God, okay? He was God, always has been. Remaining what he was, he became what he was not. Remaining what he was, he became what he was not. And because of Jesus' love for humanity, he humbly chose to place himself under the limitations of humanity, taking on this second nature, this human nature, not 50-50, 100% God and 100% man, and he placed himself under the limitations of a human being. I mean, I don't know if you ever fully thought about this. Like, sometimes we read the Christmas story, and again, like I said last week, we just kind of grow numb to it. But Jesus fully limited himself just like you and I are limited as human beings. He grew up through the various developmental stages in life, right? He was born as a baby. He nursed with his mother Mary. He was a toddler who had to learn how to walk. Right? We read scripture, it says he, he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He developed through those, he limited himself to develop through those things. God, the God of glory does not have to go through all those things. But he limited himself in taking on that human nature in order to do so, so that he could die for us on a cross one day. But he grows up through these developmental uh, uh, levels in life. He's a baby and then a toddler, then he's an elementary uh, student, right? And then he goes through that armpit of humanity called middle school, all right? He didn't do it. Like, that right there should be enough to say, amen, thank you, Jesus, let's go home, right? He willingly went through middle school for us. We know how bad that is. Some of you guys, most of you guys have experienced all that so far. There might be a few middle schoolers in the room right now. I'm sorry for what you're having to go through right now. But Jesus did the same thing. He became a teenager. Then he became a man, a carpenter, working alongside with his father, until he grew him, but he went through the very, various developmental stages of life. He limited himself. He was a true human being. Uh, if you read the scriptures, you see there's places in there where he hungers. He's hungry. His stomach started growling right after he's out in the wilderness for the 40 days being tempted. He's hungry and he eats, and the angels bring him bread, and he, he eats physical food. Uh, when he's on the cross, we see that he's thirsty. He asks for something to drink while he's hanging on the cross. He's thirsty. Um, he experienced sorrow. Uh, his friend Lazarus, who died, he wasn't faking that. He wasn't acting like he was crying. He genuinely felt the emotion and the pain of the loss of a friend. So he went through every single stage of that, even to the point at which he was able to feel and suffer pain and death, eventually, is where Paul is going to take us here in this passage, on a, on a cross, excuse me. Jesus endured all of these pieces of humanity because he was fully human and yet fully God at the same time. Hebrews 4 says it so beautifully. I'll just tell you, if you need some, some Jesus, go read the book of Hebrews. Beautiful, beautiful book of the Bible. It talks about Jesus is better than the old covenant. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the law. Jesus is better than Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest, all right? That, that high priestly line when they did all the sacrificial system things in the Old Testament. Aaron was the head of that thing, brother of Moses. Remember, he was the spokesman that spoke on behalf of Moses because Moses stuttered. Hebrews says, Jesus is better than any Aaron has ever been. Anybody that came from Aaron's line, Jesus is better. And this is why he says that's true, Hebrews 4.15. 4, 4, for we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect, you got to say every respect. We have a high priest who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. He endured all those things that you've gone through in this life. He understands the temptation that you face. He understands you and why you messed up and fell into that sin that you were involved in last week or last year, or maybe one that God's given you victory over to this point. Now, he never sinned. We know that to be true as well. 
but he understood and felt the temptation and the emotion and the pressure to do so. He understood that because he was fully human. And he says, Paul says, hey, look, he's a faithful high priest for that reason. He can sympathize with what you're going through in every situation. He understands the feelings that you encounter as human beings. Jesus t- emptied himself and took on a full nature of humanity when he came to the earth. And so Jesus is the only person in history to have two full natures. Again, I said a moment ago, it's not 50% this and 50% this. It's 100% God and 100% man. In theology, that's what they call the hypostatic union. Okay, Fancy word. Basically, all it means is two full natures in one person. Okay. No other human being has the ability to do so, and no one ever will have the ability to be what Jesus was when he came as a man in that hypostatic union. Fully God and fully man. Now, another reason we know that he was fully God, okay, he was full deity, was what Paul writes in Colossians. Now, there's several passages we can go to. I'm just going to give you one, and we're going to talk about it for a minute, okay? Um, Colossians 2, uh, verse 9, uh, Paul says this, For in him, that's Jesus, okay, for in him uh, uh, the whole fullness, all of it, of deity, dwells, what's the last word? Bodily, okay? For in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity, of who God is, all of his power, all of his might, it dwelled bodily in Jesus Christ. Not part of it, not a remnant of it, but all of his deity. Paul says, look, Jesus was 100% God and yet also 100% man. Now, the other reason we know that he was uh, still fully God, he was still fully uh, deity, was because there were various times in Jesus' life whenever he pulled back the curtain and the veil and he showed his deity, didn't he? There were a few times where he opened up his shirt and he showed the S on his chest. And it didn't stand for Superman. It stood for Son of the Living God. And he would heal people, right? He would raise people from the dead. He would feed thousands of people with a small amount of food. I don't know about you, but I can't do that as a human being. What he was doing was showing off his deity, his godness. He says, look at this. Now, we also know that he never did this for his own advantage. He never did this on a whim. He never did it to show off. He did it under the will will of the Father. When God told him to do it, he would do it. Uh, We see other places uh, when he walked on the water, okay? I don't know about you, but I can't walk on water unless I've seen a snake and I'm running really fast to get away from it, okay? That's just me. Maybe you're not scared of them as bad as I am. Human beings can't do that. He was showing his deity uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. He goes up there with a couple of the disciples, and they're able to see his glory. He pulls back the veil and says, look, this is who I am. I am God. And they loved it. It was a powerful moment. Think about Jesus' baptism, okay? We see God the Father speaking. We see the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. Then we see Jesus getting baptized. All that in that moment is is revealing his deity, all right? God says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And if you think about this, the reason that he got crucified in the first place was why? Because he claimed to be God. He said, this man blasphemes and says he's God, he, he would not claim to be deity and go to, the cross, go to the cross if he weren't deity, if he weren't fully God. But the religious people crucified him and said, you know what, he blasphemes and says that he's God, so let's string him up or let's crucify him. He was fully God and he was fully man. In these moments, he would unveil that glory for brief moments for those uh, in his presence under the will of the Father. Again, never to his own advantage. And so Jesus, though he was fully God, he laid aside his right to outwardly express himself as God in order to become one of us and express himself as a human being. Again, he didn't have to, but he he limited himself. Instead of using his rights and his power for his own glory, he emptied himself and became a servant and was born at Christmas in a lowly stable in a manger as a human being. And I'll just say this too. This is what's so powerful about him being fully God. Like if he were fully God the whole time he were here on the earth, he were fully God and fully man. That means at any point when it got uncomfortable, at any point when he was frustrated, at any point when he didn't like what he was experiencing, he could have hopped on the next flight back to heaven and gotten out of here. And said, hey, God, God the Father, I get what you're trying to do here. I, I, I realize, you know, we need to save these people, but I don't want to do this anymore. I'm out of here. He's fully God. He could have totally done that. Yet he loved us so much that he was willing to endure the limitations and the pain and eventually the death of humanity because he loved us and he wanted to bring us home. 
that he was fully God and yet fully man for you and for me so that he could bring us home again. He's willing to go to death, which is where Paul takes us lastly here as we close. So Jesus was eternally God. Jesus became one of us. And then number three, we see that Jesus died for us. Jesus died for us. Philippians 2, verse 8 says, In being found in human form, okay, in human expression, right? He humbled himself. There's the servant talk again. By becoming obedient. Who's being obedient to? Heavenly, his heavenly father, okay? He's not acting out of his own will at all, out of his own volition. He's only doing the will of the father, okay? He limited himself to that obedience. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, this wasn't just a fact-finding mission for Jesus. He wasn't just out scouting things out for us. This was a rescue mission. And Jesus didn't become a man just to sympathize with us and see our need. He came to sympathize with us so that he could meet our need. See, if he just came and understood what it was like to be a man and then went back home to heaven, right? That didn't fix or cure anything. We're still left in our sins. But not only did he come and sympathize and understand what we're going through, he made a way of escape, a way to come home by way of the cross. That's a great place to say amen. Thank you. I heard two of you there. He came to die in our place. That wrath that we talked about last week that we deserved on ourselves because of our rebellion and our sin and our idolatry. He took it upon himself on the cross so that we could be brought home and be saved. And I'll tell you this too, it's important to note here that if at any point Jesus was not both fully God and fully man, we do not stand redeemed and saved today and restored back to the Father. See, he had to be both fully God and fully man in order to die on the cross as our sacrifice. As the divine son of God, okay, as the divine son, he alone satisfies God's own judgment against us in the demand for perfect obedience. See, he was the perfect sacrifice that none of us could be. That meant God had to step out of eternity into time and space and become a man. But he had to be fully God because none of us, no matter how much we'd like to do this, we can't even die and atone for our own sins. That's how wicked and sinful we were. That's where you get the picture in the Old Testament with the sacrificial system. That's why when they came to present a sacrifice, it wasn't just any old lamb. It was a perfect spotless lamb. That was a picture. And they would sacrifice it and spill its blood and take its life to cover their sins temporarily. That was a picture, a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ to come because he was the only one who could be that perfect sacrifice. No human being, no animal could take that place. It had to be God. So that meant he had to be 100% fully God. The other side of that coin is this. As the incarnate son, the son in the flesh, the human being in the flesh, he alone can identify with us as our representative and our substitute. If you were to go over and read Romans chapter 5, don't turn there now, but Romans 5, Paul lays out how that Adam was our original human father who led us into sin. We inherited our sin nature from Adam. Adam was the representative of the human fleshly race. And so what it took was, Paul says he calls him the second Adam, a better Adam, a greater Adam comes in, who is Jesus Christ, that will represent humanity on that cross. See, he had to be fully human to represent us, but he had to be fully God and perfect to be that perfect sacrifice. And so if at any point he was one or the other and not both fully God and fully man at the same time, he could not bring us salvation and he could not bring us home. And I'll say this lastly as I wrap up. When it comes to the cross, I think the cross is where we see Jesus emptying himself played out to the fullest. See, in emptying himself, he did limit himself from the way he expressed himself as God. He limited himself of the glory that he had when he was in heaven to come be a humble human being. But I think the greatest way in which Jesus emptied himself was when he was on the cross because he emptied himself in this sense. In order to pay for our sin, listen closely, he had to break fellowship with God his Father. See, to this point, to the point at which Jesus hung on that old rugged cross, he had only known perfect fellowship with God the Father. He had only known his Father's favor 
on him. He had only known what Jesus or what God said of Jesus at his baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He had only known the face of his father shining upon him in that relationship within the Trinity that he had had to this point. But as he took our sins upon him on the cross, God turned from Jesus. Because if you read Habakkuk in the Old Testament, little known book in the Old Testament, you might not, may have never read it before. It actually tells us that God cannot look upon evil. He cannot look upon sin. And then Paul in Corinthians goes over and he writes another place in 1 Corinthians. He says, look, he says, Jesus who knew no sin, he became sin for us. He took all of the sins of the world on his shoulders, on his body, on that cross. And because of it, God could not look at him, could not look at that sin and broke that fellowship while he was on that cross. And so on that dark Friday afternoon on a hill called Calvary, the father turned his face away from Jesus and the ancient eternal fellowship Jesus had experienced to that point was broken with his heavenly father as his heavenly father rained down the wrath of God on his son. That wrath that you deserved the wrath that I deserved came down upon a perfect Jesus on the cross as he hung there with the sins of the world on his shoulders. He took the wrath of God. He took the rejection from the Father as he hung on that cross. And in his agony and his torment, the Scriptures tell us that he cries out from the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken on that cross so that we could be forgiven and brought home. And that cross was the greatest emptying Jesus endured to bring us home. And let me tell you, I don't know if you ever thought about this before, but when Christ was hanging there on that cross, he knew who you were. He knew your sin. That sin that you think nobody knows about, Jesus knew about that cross, and that was one of the sins he took on his body on the cross. He knew about that secret sin that you think nobody else knows about but you. And maybe that's true, but God knows about that sin. He took the sins of every human being, past, present, and future, from this wicked, evil, hopeless, helpless world, and he placed them on himself on that cross so that you could be saved and brought home, so that you no longer had to endure or be under the wrath of a holy God. And he did that knowing how rebellious and sinful you were. I don't know about you, but that, I think that's incredible love. That's amazing love that ought to wow us, that ought to fill our spirits with such joy and thrill this time of year as we think about Christmas. He endured it all for you. He endured it all for the sins of humanity, even when he didn't have to. Jesus loved us so much that Jesus left home to bring us home. Jesus left home to bring us home. Jesus left home to bring you home today. Jesus left the comfort and the glory of heaven to become a humble human being to bring you home. He endured that separation, that emptying, when his relationship was broken with his father on that cross to bring you home. He loved you that much, even when you were his enemy, even when you were in rebellion and shaking your fists at the heavens saying, God, I'll take it from here. I no longer need you. He stepped out of the comforts and the glory of heaven as the eternal God, and he became one of us so that he could die for us even when he, we were his enemies. That he loved you that much to bring you back home to God. You see, when God wanted to communicate his love for us, he didn't shout it from a distance. He didn't sit back and talk about it. He came to deliver it in person, and he delivered it in the person of Jesus Christ. To John 1, one of the gospels, he says, no one's ever seen God, but if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And see, what Jesus did is, as God, his heart of love for us was represented through the life of Jesus in the greatest display of who God is we could ever have. And he did it 
for you and for me so that he could bring us home. He didn't do it so we could have traditions at Christmas like Christmas trees. He didn't do it so we could hang garland, not that there's anything wrong with any of those things. He didn't do it so we could sing Christmas carols and we could have a big Christmas dinner together. He did it so that you could come home again because otherwise we're lost, we're helpless, and we're hopeless in our sin apart from Jesus Christ becoming a man and dying for our sins. God gave us a perfect picture of his love through Jesus. And he did it all to bring us home. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for Jesus. What he did on that cross, what he did in humbling himself and becoming a man, words can't express our gratitude. Words can't express the joy that fills us in this Christmas season of what we get to celebrate, what Jesus did for us. Thank you for sending the greatest expression of your love that ever could have been shown in Jesus Christ. And God, in this Christmas season, may we not be numb to what took place, the depth and gravity of what took place in the Christmas story. As we read Luke 2 and listen to how Jesus came into this world. He stepped into time and space. God, let it wow us. The humility it took to do such a thing and the humility and servanthood and humiliation it took to go to a cross for our sin. Father, we are so grateful. God, we're so thankful. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to continue in worship. If God's dealt with your heart, Maybe you need to ask God to just wow you again with Christmas. Maybe your heart's grown cold. You've gotten so caught up with the cares of the world around us, the issues of our day, that you've forgotten what Christmas really means and why it's so important. Maybe just make that seat right where you're at in the altar and talk to God about it. You're welcome to use the front. If you'd like to use the front, pray. Come up here and pray. And I would say this too. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you've never come home. You've never accepted him as your personal savior. I'm going to be right here in the front. Please come tap me on the shoulder. I'd love to show you how you can know that you're saved. If you're joining us online, you're sitting on that couch right now, and you're listening to this, and you need to accept Jesus Christ, hit your knees right there next to that couch and ask Christ to come into your heart and save you this morning. He'll change your life forever if you'll come home to him at Christmas. Let's sing together.